Hi everyone, my name is Delaney Alstolino. I will be presenting a case study about HIV and AIDS. I hope you enjoy it. All right, let's start with step one, background information. The CDC determined that HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, is a virus that is spread through bodily fluids such as blood, semen, rectal and vaginal fluids, and breast milk. Essentially, HIV enters human immune cells called CD4 T cells that are responsible for fighting off infections. When the virus is unleashed into the CD4 T cell, it releases its RNA that becomes DNA and incorporates it into the human cell, ultimately taking control of the system. Eventually, HIV kills these T cells to the point where the human body can't fight it off, leaving it vulnerable to opportunistic infections. Once a person with HIV has a CD4 T cell count less than 200 and an opportunistic infection, we classify them as having AIDS. Step 2. Analyzing the current situation. HIV still remains an incurable disease. It's important to recognize that the Center for Disease Control has been actively trying to solve this problem as well as improve the lives of HIV and AIDS patients. Today, after research and development by pharmaceutical companies, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has approved more than 20 anti-HIV medications for patients. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services provides HIV treatment guidelines to physicians and patients and updates them as the FDA approves new treatment protocols. The strength that comes with the CDC's research and development of HIV and AIDS is the fact that every new discovery expands the lifespans of patients. Receiving news that you are HIV positive is no longer a death sentence due to the advancements of antiretroviral medications that help fight the HIV virus. The weakness to this, however, is that these medications eventually become resistant after long-term long use. One opportunity that the CDC, alongside other governmental research agencies, have is the ability to discover some sort of vaccine that can make all humans immune to this disease. Pharmaceutical companies have focused on an HIV vaccine since the discovery of the virus, so this is a very important and hopeful prospect for the future. One threat to the improvements the CDC has made in reducing and treating HIV is the fact that the view of HIV and AIDS being chronic but treatable has caused gay men to resume risky behaviors, which is a huge concern to the public health community. Next, we're going to look at step three, prioritizing core issues. The CDC states that currently 1.2 million in the U.S. are infected with HIV and AIDS. What's more alarming is that one-eighth of the people currently don't know they are infected. Gay and bisexual men are the population most affected by this disease. While the rates of infection have varied over race and over time, it is important to note that young African-American and Hispanic gay and bisexual men have experienced an increase in diagnosis, while other racial groups have experienced a decrease. As stated before, because there is currently no cure in sight, when deciding how to address the large amount of the population infected with the virus and the potential infections in the future, we have to prioritize preventing the spread of infection. Which leads into step four, analyzing alternatives. When it comes to preventing the spread of HIV, we are going to apply the health belief model by having a better understanding of an individual's perceived severity, susceptibility, benefits, and barriers. We can remind everyone that they are susceptible to HIV and AIDS and that once you have it, you are infected for life. The first approach I propose is implementing peer mentor groups that openly talk about susceptibility and severity of HIV. Social network approaches have been utilized to minimize the spread of STIs and can be used in the same way in regards to HIV. Because these groups will openly talk about the dangers and risks that come with HIV in an open setting often, the mentees will have a better understanding of how this affects them and how to minimize their risky behaviors to ensure they don't get HIV. The second approach I propose to establish um, establish susceptibility to HIV is through school condom programs. Providing free condoms in a university establishes that wearing condoms is important to stop the spread of STIs and HIV. Condom programs also remove the barrier of people claiming they didn't have access to one because they're in the main lobby of their living spaces. Overall, by having these resources available in students' living quarters, they are more likely to recognize the benefits that come with wearing condom and the severity that could follow if they don't. Next, we're going to look at step five, providing recommendations. Based on what I've talked about earlier, I propose two different ways that aim to improve prevention of HIV. The first recommendation I propose is to establish mandatory HIV tests. The CDC states that HIV testing that occurs as part of an individual's routine healthcare visit is especially important because it creates the opportunity to diagnose infections in people who may not consider themselves at risk for HIV. For those HIV negative, these tests can establish the concepts of the health belief model by reminding people of their susceptibility. And by diagnosing infected individuals earlier, we can help stop their unknown spreading to other individuals. The second recommendation I propose is to establish needle exchange programs around the U.S. As described in the CDC and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services guidance, needle exchange programs are an effective component of a comprehensive integrated approach to HIV prevention. By imp implementing needle exchange programs around the U.S., we can at least ensure that drug users, one of the most susceptible groups to HIV, can have access to clean syringes and reduce the spread of disease within their groups. 
Next, we're going to look at step six, establishing an action plan. The action plan I am proposing contains four points to be completed within the next eight years. First is to increase the percentage of people living with HIV who know they are infected to 90% by 2020. Second is to reduce the percentage of young gay and bisexual men who engage in high-risk behaviors by 10% by 2020. Third is to reduce the rate of death from AIDS by 30% by 2020. And lastly is to present new drugs that reduce the risk of antiretroviral resistance by 2025. I think these goals can not only reduce the transmission rate of HIV in the U.S., but also create new antiretroviral medications that can further extend the lives of infected individuals. This is my opinion now. So before doing this pr presentation, if someone were to ask me if I was at risk for contracting HIV and AIDS, I would definitely say I wasn't. However, I think the biggest takeaway we can all take from this is that at some point in our lives, we'll all be at risk for contracting HIV. After considerable research, I really believe that everyone should be tested for HIV at some point in our lives. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and thank you.